Welcome back, everyone, to our third seminar in this series. Uh, a reminder of what I've said before in these other ones, all the material developed in this webinar was as of about the middle of September 2012. Since I can't be certain when you are watching this webinar, please be aware that PAPACA is a constantly evolving act, and we have had a particularly large number of changes uh, in late 2012, and we expect to have uh, new seminars, webinars, and, uh, and actual uh, physical presentations on a whole host of new regulations and clarifications after January 1st, 2013. Much of the material we're learning today is in its infancy form, and these new regulations will probably expand and clarify a number of issues that may come to mind as we make this presentation. As you can see from the title of our course, How to Explain Math Behind Papaka, uh, this course is uh, really going to deal with some things that uh, generally I've found uh, uh, audiences uh, absolutely hate. That is, a bunch of mathematical formulas that we will demonstrate to you uh, that will become very handy for you to try to explain to an employer whether he is liable for penalties and what his case group size would be and all that sort of stuff. If you have a hard time following this, um, please go back and review the webinar twice and don't feel uh, bad about it. Uh, math is one of those subjects that's kind of, uh, if you remember from school, there were certain kids that got it and boy, there were just certain people that didn't get it. And sometimes it doesn't matter how intelligent or forthright you might be. Uh, I remember a program uh, from the 1990s that uh, the public broadcasting system put out. It was a documentary by Ken Burns called The Civil War. It was a nine-part documentary. And in that documentary, uh, there's a particular emphasis on a Brigadier General, General uh, Joshua Chamberlain, who was with the uh, Union forces at Gettysburg. He won the Congressional Medal of Honor due to his heroism at holding a little round top, as it was called, and that was a key turning point to the war. Well, Joshua was a very intelligent fellow, and after the Civil War, he uh, returned to his home state of Maine, became governor for a few times. After serving in the governor of Maine, he returned to his alma mater, uh, Bowdoin College in Maine, and he became the president of that, uh, of that college, a well-renowned college for its day, still is. As the president of Bowdoin College, he taught every course in the curriculum, whether it be foreign language, science, whatever it may be, he taught every course in the curriculum at least once, except, you guessed it, for math. That just wasn't something he was going to do. So if this seems a little hard for you to follow, remember some great people have had problem with math. Let's go ahead and make the best of what we can. Starting in January 1st, 2014, the employer's responsibility is to pay or play. That is to either go ahead and play in the system and buy and offer health insurance coverage to employees or to pay a penalty of some sort to the, to the uh, government. However, the penalty is not uh, uniform, and it's only for certain size companies. We have generally said that it's for companies of 50 employees or more, but that's not quite accurate, because like what so happens so often in so many government programs, uh, how they count things and how the rest of the world count things doesn't always seem to be the same. What's going to happen today, as you're listening to this uh, seminar, is we're going to learn about what we call full-time equivalents, because that's what the rules apply to in PAPACA. Not the number of employees you have, full-time or part-time, but the number of full-time equivalents. In fact, you're going to see an example where a company with as little as 20 full-time employees could end up having to pay a penalty because of the way the PAPACA defines things. <clears throat> but one of the first things you're going to find out also is that PAPACA is going to be talking about employees in three different categories. And they're not going to sound like the same categories you're used to hearing, full-time, part-time, and seasonal. PAPACA has very clear definitions of what each of these kinds of people say uh, or, or what they are, and it doesn't really matter what the employer says. So an employer can call a person a full-time or part-time or whatever, or seasonal, or whatever it may be. <clears throat> PAPACA decides its own level of uh, what constitutes full, part, and seasonal. <clears throat> so to begin with, 
Full-time employees for Papaka is going to be anyone working at the rate of 30 hours or more per week determined on a monthly basis. Because different states are going to have different definitions of full-time and overtime pay, you could have some situations where someone is uh, working full-time and only working four days a week, for example, or even three days a week if there's enough uh, time spans. Because of it being 30 hours per week, if you were working in a state that uh, allowed someone to go 10 hours a day without overtime, then three days would make that person full time. Let's look at some other parts of this mathematical equation that uh, Papaka is going to take us into. <clears throat> when it comes to penalties, we have some general guidelines we talk about. But what you're going to find <clears throat> is that penalties are going to be different depending upon whether an employer offers no coverage or whether the co employer offers coverage that is deemed not affordable. And not affordable doesn't mean what you or I or the employer or even the employee thinks. It's a mathematical definition within PAPACA, and we'll get to it. <clears throat> In 2014, the mandate on the employer is to offer coverage if he's a certain size employer. The mandate on the individual is to have coverage. Now, Papaka doesn't care where the individual gets that coverage. He can get it at work. He could buy it himself. He could buy it through an exchange. He could buy it on the open market. His grandmother could buy it for him for all Papaka cares. But basically what Papaka says, unless you have very low income and you are eligible for Medi-Cal, in this state it's Medi-Cal, Medicaid in other states, then you as a U.S. citizen have to carry a certain level of health insurance or you are subject to having a penalty, or rather a tax uh, assigned to you on your income tax. So we assume that starting in the filing of taxes on 2014, that would be filing in 2015 obviously, that the uh, IRS will have some sort of a box in the, um, in the filing that will say, do you have health insurance for you and your family? Yes or no? If so, what kind, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to find a little bit later that it isn't just a matter of having any health insurance, it's a matter of having a certain type of health insurance that meets minimum essential benefits and minimum levels of coverages. But we'll get back to that. But what we need to take away from the first two slides is large employers could, could be subject to penalties and individuals could be subject to additional taxes on their individual return. So let's start with the math of a large employer. What exactly is a large employer? We talk about it incorrectly as being that Papaka says any employer with 50 or more could have a penalty. Well, that's not exactly right. As you're going to see, because you see a formula up on your screen now, we're going to actually walk you through these numbers to calculate an employer's size. Because what you're really going to talk about in terms of an employer is, does he have 50 or more full-time equivalents. And that's a very specific numerical definition. That's what that chart's all about. And we're going to find out we can have 20 full-time employees and lots of part-time people and end up being a 50-plus full-time equivalent. If you take a look at the bottom of your screen below the uh, formula that's listed there, it shows you full-time is defined as 30 hours. And a company without a prior year of uh, operation would do this calculation based upon what they reasonably expect for the current calendar year. Now, the second definition below it, the one with two asterisks, full-time employees who work less than 120 days in a year are considered seasonal and are not included in this calculation. I want to cover that for a second here. You and I think of full-time seasonal people is typically perhaps uh, a group of construction people who come in and work on roofing houses during the three months of the dry season. That would be 90 consecutive days and in most occasions their seasonal people are not all long enough to actually be able to get onto a company's insurance plan. Well Papak envisioned seasonal as somebody who, for example, worked full-time at a bookstore at the first of the uh, uh, the first of the year when the school year opened up in a college. Maybe they worked 30 days. They then worked 30 days full-time at the first opening session of the summer period. 
And then finally, when the fall session comes back ar around, that bookstore hires that person back again. They work another 30 full-time days. Well, that person has worked 90 full-time days, not consecutively. But as a result of working 90, meaning less than 120, that employee is going to be called seasonal. And that is going to impact the employer or could impact the employer in terms of penalties. So obviously, a person who works full-time, 30 hours or more, uh, more than 120 days or more, uh, then he's full-time. Anybody who is not full-time or seasonal goes into the part-time count. One of the things you're going to discover when we do the next round of classes after January 1st, 2013, is how to go about counting all these people during the course of a prior year is an extremely complicated thing which we've not included in this seminar because the regs are not finalized yet. But we do know those regs will be coming out shortly. So stay in touch with your Warden Brown um, sales representative to make sure that you get involved in either the uh, physical seminars we hold in various locations or in follow-up webinars such as this one. But for now, understanding the full-time seasonal and part-time are the only three classifications of employees. Before we actually do the math to calculate out the size of a company, I want to take you on those three categories of employees to understand what causes penalties. You see, Papaka envisions you going through a series of steps. The first step is to decide whether the employer is large or not. If it's determined the employer is not large, then it doesn't matter what his people do. He cannot get a penalty. You can only get a penalty if you're defi defined as a large employer. But this will probably surprise many of you. I could be a large employer with 1,000 full-time employees, not offer any health coverage at all, and get absolutely no penalty. Because the employer's size simply makes them eligible for penalties. It doesn't mean that they're actually going to get them. Certain kinds of things have to happen before you actually get the penalty. For one, does an employer have to cover part-time people? No. As you can see from the chart on the second, on the second line, while part-time people are used to calculate the size of the group, no employer has to offer part-time people anything. So all of us part-time people can go off and get health insurance and get government grants for free health insurance, whatever it may be, subsidized health insurance, the employer can't be penalized. Could the employee be, employer be penalized if his full-time people don't have coverage or have sufficient coverage? Yes, he could be. Doesn't mean he will be. He says he could be. But here's the trick. While seasonal people, those full-time employees who work less than 120 days in a year, while those seasonal people are not counted to determine the group size, they are used to determine the total penalties that an employer will pay. The rationale for this under Papaka is, as a hypothetical, imagine you have a company that during three months of the summer years hire certain types of individuals to be drywallers in a construction area for building suburbs. At the end of the dry season of the summer after 90 days, those people are fired and they move into uh, perhaps the wine country in Northern California and spend three months picking grapes, part of the wine harvest. Again, they haven't worked 120 days, but they've been working full time, 90 days. At the end of that period with the harvest finished, they're fired and they move on to work road construction for a private firm that's been hired perhaps to move snow up in the upper area, remove tree limbs, whatever it may be for the rough winter season on the roads up there. They again work 90 days or three months. And when that sea turn of season occurs, they move back into the San Joaquin Valley to help for three months in the planting of the new, of the new crops for the year. So that individual has worked every month of the year, but no longer than three months for any one employer. Well, Papaka would not come about and say that if an employer had to give health insurance coverage, that he should pay the full penalty for someone who only worked for him for three months. So what Papaka is going to do with these seasonal people 
is allow an employer to get penalties during certain times of the year when the seasonal people are working for him, and then when they're not working for him, he is not penalized. But the net effect of that employee who has worked a full year, three months, three months, three months, three months, he would be going to the exchange to buy his own insurance individual policy. And if he's getting premium credits, which he probably is, because that type of work means he's probably somewhere near the federal poverty level that's allowed in Papaka, because he's getting that penalty, the employer is effectively having that employee pay for the coverage using our tax dollars, and Papaka turns around and says, then the employer, for those three months he's hired, has to pay some portion of that back. So a full-time person can kick off a penalty. A seasonal person can kick off the penalty when he's working for those months. But a part-time person can never kick off the penalty to the employer. But when it comes to counting group size, full-time equivalents, the only ones that count for that, then, are full-time people and part-time people, not seasonal people. Well, that's enough to confuse Brigadier General Chamberlain, I'm sure, but we'll see how that works as we go along. Let's take an example. I brought up a blank form. What I'm going to do is uh, move forward. I'm going to fill in all the blanks for you and then walk you through the explanation seeing the numbers. Again, I call your attention to the bottom of the difference between full-time versus seasonal. As you can see at the top, we're going to calculate whether this sample company is full, is large, 50 full-time equivalents or more, or whether it's small. This particular company has 40 full-time people and uses 20 part-time people. Each one of his part-time people works 10 hours each week. Now, the formulas used in the regulations that are coming out are much more complex than what I'm demonstrating in this seminar. But I want to keep it simple just so you can sort of get the, the broad base idea. I'm going to assume that every month has exactly four weeks in it, every week having exactly five work days. In reality, employers are going to have to track part-time hours in all sorts of unusual ways, two hours here, three hours there, five hours there. I've had full-time employees that work maybe only four days a week or three or five or whatever it may be. It's going to be a lot of tracking of hours uh, in order to do this calculation. But for simplicity's sake, we're going to make it easy. 40 people working full-time, 20 part-timers, each one working 10 hours each week. I put the answers in, so let's read down the formula. A says, how many full-time employees did I have last year? Well, in this answer, as you can see from the top, it says 40. I write the number 40 in. How many hours was worked by a part-timer in a month? Well, a part-timer is working 10 hours each week. He works four weeks. That's 40 hours per part-timer. How many part-timers in C were actually used during that month? And the answer was 20, as given with the example description above. D multiplies B times C in order to get the total number of part-time hours that were worked by everybody. In this case, 20 times 40 is 800. We divide by 120. The reason we divide by 120 is because Papaka tells us to divide by 120, but the logic of Papaka telling us to do it is that if the person had worked more than that, they would be up top in the full-time employees category. So what we're trying to find out is, how many part-time people sort of make up a composite full-time person and divide by the 120, which is the seasonal cutoff definition. 120 into 800 gives us 6.66, and as is usual with the IRS, we've got to be rounding it up to seven. So we have seven equivalent full-time people using all of our part-timers, and we have 40 real full-time people. This company has 47 people. It is underneath is 47 full-time equivalents. It is underneath the 50 full-time equivalents category, so it is deemed a small company, and no matter what happens, this employer cannot get penalties. By the way, when I say no matter what happens, I should take that back. Rather, obviously, if he hires a lot of people, buys another company, merges into another company, and becomes a larger company later on, obviously be able to get penalties at that point. But as long as he stays at this 47, he's fine. So what causes an employer to have a penalty kicked off? 
let's assume he's over the 50 full-time equivalencies. What kind of characteristics identify when an employer would be penalized? As I've said a couple of times already, I'm going to repeat it again. Part-time employees never cause an employer a penalty. But full-time and seasonal do. Most of us believe we've heard, and somewhat accurately, that the penalty for an employer not offering care, health insurance, is either two or three thousand dollars. We're not quite sure generally which it will be. But one has to think about that. Because an employer could have an individual causing a penalty for two months. Does that mean he's going to pay the full year penalty? No. The actual fact is the penalty is not two or three thousand dollars. It's one twelfth of two or three thousand dollars for every month that the penalty is being applied. So the only time an employer would pay two or three thousand dollars penalty for the year is if he had the same exact penalty situation twelve months during the year. Obviously, if he had them only for six months of the year, he'd be paying one half of the two thousand or the three thousand. So as the slide says, as you can see, what we're really talking about is penalties are a per month calculation. And here's a handy dandy little chart to show you when a penalty could possibly occur. Again, this is assuming the employer is 50 full-time equivalents or more. If he's less than 50 full-time equivalents, the chart doesn't apply, no penalty applies. So let's read across the top. If he's a 50 plus full-time equivalent company, he could offer coverage. He could offer coverage that mathematically will be defined as unaffordable or he could offer no coverage at all. In the first line, you can see the employee, despite what the employer does, simply does not go out and get his own coverage. He doesn't try to buy it privately or through the exchange. Since he didn't try to buy it, since therefore there's no premium tax credit, no penalty applies. This is the example I gave you where a fellow could have a thousand full-time employees, but if none of those employees go out to get their own coverage, he's off the hook. The second category, is an employee who goes to exchange to get coverage. Now, this has to be through the exchange. If he buys it on the private uh, side, outside of the exchange, doesn't count. The employee goes to the exchange and gets his coverage, but he makes so much money that he doesn't get any premium tax credit, no help from the state or federal government. Again, as you can see, no penalties apply. Here would be a classic example. Let's say I had a firm of 60 very highly paid engineers, all single to make it simple. I'm paying each of the engineers around $90,000 a year. I give absolutely no health insurance. All of them go to the exchange and ask to buy coverage, and all of them are told you can buy coverage, but you'll get no government help. You make too much money. Then the employer gets no penalty. As you can see, the penalty for an employer to get it takes two things. He has to, one, be 50-plus full-time equivalent, and Two, as in the last line, he has to have an employee that gets premium tax credits from the exchange. So he has an employee. He, in the first column, is offering coverage. And for whatever reason, that employee goes off to the exchange and buys some coverage, and he makes a, a low enough amount of money that he gets a premium tax credit. At that point, the employer is going to have some kind of penalty, either two or 3000 on a prorated basis, which we will show you in a little bit. What if he offers coverage but it's unaffordable? In other words, he's asking the employee to pay more than a fair share. And we'll define what a fair share is in a little bit. Likewise, again, the coverage could be two or $3,000 of penalty on a prorated basis. But now let's go to that buyer who does not offer any coverage at all. That one's simple. If he offers no coverage and the employee goes to the exchange and gets a premium tax credit, he will be penalized on a $2,000 basis for every month, that every person for every month that he's involved with. This is really the, uh, the standard penalty that we talk about when we're talking about pay and play, where the guy just refuses to offer any fringe benefit to employ his employees.
In looking at that chart, you might say, well, gosh, a guy who offers coverage, employer offers coverage, but the person doesn't take it, could have two or 3,000 in penalty, but the guy who offers nothing gets the lower penalty of 2,000. Well, we're going to find that an employer would really rather be penalized on the $3,000 basis because the amount of dollars are multiplied by different things in Papaka. When an employer ends up with a $3,000 prorated penalty, he's going to be multiplying it by a very smaller number than on the 2000 So it'll turn out, as you'll see, that the $3,000 penalty is actually less when you finally look at it. So let's do another example of an employer group and see whether they can be small or large. Here we have a sample company. We'll call this company a construction firm. They have 20 full-time people, and or maybe they're a... Um, um, a gardening firm, you know, something like that. Or perhaps it's a fellow who owns uh, four McDonald's in town under uh, one corporate license, and he has uh, five full-time employees, each of them, and 40 part-timers every month. Either way, what we got here is 20 full-time people, 40 part-timers. And these part-timers each work 24 hours each week. So let's fill in the blanks. What we have is the total number of full-time employees is 20. B, total hours worked by a part-timer in a month. Well, if a part-timer works 25, four hours a week, four weeks, it's 96 hours in a month. How many part-timers did that? 40. 40 times 96 gives you the total number of part-time hours worked, 3,840. We divide back by our 120, because that's our seasonal definition, and we end up with 32 full-time equivalents. And that ends up with a company over the limit. This company with 20 full-time people is a 52-life full-time equivalency company. So when we talk about, oh, this only affects employers with 50 or more employees, here's a demonstration where a company with 20 full-time employees could still end up being being deemed full size because of the number of part-time hours being used. Again, keep in mind, the fact that a company is declared large group, as this one is, does not mean that they're going to get a penalty. It just means they're eligible to get a penalty. Well, let's look at this uh, process of the penalty itself before we continue on. The calculation of the penalty is really not complicated. You just have to remember that it's going to be prorated for the number of months that you're in the penalty box, so to speak. It's going to be one twelfth of two thousand or one twelfth of three thousand for every month that the employer is liable. But here's a catch: there's a certain minimum threshold that must be met before actually any payment occurs. So a, la a large fifty-plus full-time equivalent company could be assigned a penalty but then not have to pay it simply because he hasn't reached a certain threshold. And we're going to look at that. Also keep in mind what we've already said. Penalties are calculated on the number of full-time and full-time seasonal, not on part-timers. Part-timers defines your group size. Seasonal doesn't define your group size, but penalties are calculated on full-time and full-time seasonal. There's the chart we're going to take a look at. As you can see, take a look at line C. It talks about some number we're going to come up with being multiplied by 166.67. If you do your math real quick, you can kind of figure out that 166.67 is one twelfth of two thousand dollars. If we were going to penalize somebody at the three thousand dollar range, it'd be one twelfth of three thousand or two hundred fifty dollars. So. Let's take a look at what we got. We're going to calculate a penalty for a large company. In this case, it's an 80-man full-time company, to make it simple. Category A says, how many full-time employees do I have in that month that I'm measuring? Answer, 80. Now I get to subtract 30. Why? Because well, Papaka says to subtract 30. There must have been some whale of a discussion in Congress as to whether we were going to subtract 30 or 20 or 10 or 50 or whatever it was going to be. 
But it was basically to give basically a margin, if you will. In other words, penalties had to rise to a certain level before they actually would be paid. So a large employer who has penalties on less than 30 people is going to end up paying nothing. In this case, though, because the employer is not offering coverage, he gets to subtract the minimum threshold number of 30, leaving him 50. And then for every month that he has those 50 people uncovered, if any of them go to get a premium tax credit from the exchange, he is fined one twelfth of $2,000 for every person in the company. And yes, you heard me right. One employee in this case kicks off the fine for everybody else. Earlier I had said you're better off being fined at the $3,000 rate than the $2,000 rate, and that's why. You see, the $3,000 rate is going to be on only those people who get credits. The $2,000 rate is on everybody minus the 30 if even just one person gets the credit when you're not offering coverage. So this large employer's penalty is going to be $8,334 for every month that he's in the penalty box. Let's assume nothing changes. He doesn't hire or fire anybody. He just keeps with his 80 employees, minus 30, leaving 50. And he pays the same exact thing because he didn't offer coverage. His annual penalty will be $100,008. But what if it was something other than not offering coverage? What if, as this chart shows, the penalty was because somebody didn't take the coverage that he offered and went to the exchange, or somebody didn't take it because it was not affordable and he went to the exchange? We'll test the affordability issue later. In that case, what you've got is the either or. Either he's going to pay at the rate of 2000 or at the rate of 3000 Take a look at these numbers that we filled them in here. The left-hand side of the chart is the same exact set of numbers that you just finished with a slide ago. It's the 80-man company minus his 30 minimum threshold multiplied by 166.67, and because just one person got a credit, his fine is against everybody. So he ends up with 100,008. On the right-hand side is the $3,000 penalty. But this is done only on those employees who go to the exchange and get a credit. In this hypothetical example, we had 20 employees go to the exchange and get a credit. It's multiplied by $250 per month. That's one twelfth of 3000 a total of 5000 If he keeps that same situation all year long, 5000 times 12 is $60,000. In this case, and probably the only time we've ever seen it, the IRS is going to declare the penalty be the lesser of the two numbers and not the greater. What this shows you is that an employer making a good faith effort to attempt to get people insured on his own health plan is treated better than an employer on the right-hand side that doesn't offer coverage at all. By the way, someone is probably thinking at this point that that's not fair if just one person, what if you have one knucklehead who wants to go to the exchange just to cause trouble for the owner? Well, if you only had one person doing it, obviously on the right-hand side then, category F in your analysis, number of full-time employees who receive premium credit to the exchange would only be one, one person, meaning there would only be a $3,000 penalty at the most. And we're not even sure that person would actually get the premium tax credit because he may not meet certain conditions. Remember our 52-man equivalent company? That was the one that was a construction company, perhaps, or a group of McDonald's? Well, if that particular group didn't offer coverage, remember our definitions. Part-time and full-time make up the group size. Penalties are full-time and seasonal, not part-time. So even though he's a 52-man life group, how many full-time did he have? A, 20. He gets to subtract minus 30 as the threshold, the minimum threshold, and he ends up with zero. So even though he's eligible for a penalty as a 52-man equivalent company, in actual fact, he doesn't get it at the moment 
Because what's going to happen if he is a construction company and during those three months of the summer, he adds on a bunch of seasonal full-time people, roofers, uh, drywallers, whatever it may be, then suddenly he may have a penalty evolve because he is a large company and then suddenly he might be over that 30 limit. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Well, we have that 52 life company we just talked about. The left-hand side is going to be identical to the slide we just saw. 20 less 30, 0, and 0. So what if in this 52-man equivalent company, three of his full-time employees went to the exchange and got premium credits? That would be at the rate of $3,000. 112 per month, 750 per month, and in this case, the fine would be 2,250 bucks. Which would he pay? The lesser of the two penalties. In this case, zero. So again, even though he's got the equivalency large size, even though he had some people getting premium credits, even though he was eligible for penalties, he actually paid nothing. But what happens if we throw in that seasonal stuff that we've been talking about? As you can see on the left-hand side, A, the example's been changed so that the number of full-time employees in a given month are his regular 20 people plus his 20 seasonal roofers or drywallers for that given month. Suddenly, on the, right hand, on the left-hand side, he now has 40 full-time employees for those three months, each of the three months during the summer. He gets to subtract the 30, just as he always does, ends up with 10, and, is pay, and has to pay $2,000 a year, or one twelfth of 2000 per month. He pays a monthly fine of 1667 But he's only had those seasonal employees for three months, so he's not going to multiply that by 12. He will multiply it for the three months that he owes the penalties, or in this case, 5001 Remember our discussion that seasonal employees may find it easier and cheaper to buy their own individual policy through the exchange and carry it with them from employer to employer. So his 20 roofers, for which he paid three months worth of penalties, take their individual policy with them when they go to do the wine grape picking, do the road construction, and do the planning in the spring. But on any of those three months that they work for any of those people, in this example to the right-hand side, you had the three people originally going in the last example to the exchange plus the 20 seasonal, multiplying it by the one-twelfth of $3,000, or in other words, 5750 But again, it's only for three months, so the penalty, 17250 applies. And what does the owner pay? The lesser of the two, 5001 as I said at the beginning, you may have to listen to this seminar a couple of times to follow all this, but one thing should be coming crystal clear. At some point, somebody has to look backwards over the course of a year to find out whether an employer had to pay premium penalties or not. Secondly, somebody has to tell the employer that he had employees who were getting premium credits through the exchange. Back on the seminar when we talked about the latest development in exchanges in California. We mentioned the fact that the exchange has to be able to interrelate with the IRS and Social Security and all those things. The exchange job is going to be able to identify an individual who is employed, whose employer is, whether he got a premium credit, send a notice up to the IRS telling them that, hey, John Doe in California got this credit. He works for Booker Construction. And the IRS has to inform Booker Construction that they have one or more people for which they could be penalized. It's possible that the IRS will finally, in its final regulations, tell an employer to figure out and pay the penalties at the end of the full year. Uh, those of us who have been studying and thinking about this also find it might be that the IRS expects an employer to pay the penalty on a quarterly basis, much the way we pay our own estimated taxes on a quarterly basis when we're self-employed. So we don't know how they're going to do it yet, but at least we know it's a question of, am I a large group? Do I have full or seasonal people who are getting premium credits? And then the calculations start from there. 
Well, when does an employee qualify for the credit? Remember my example of just some uh, bozo in the company that just wants to cause trouble for the employer, so he just refuses to take the employer's health care plan and wanders off to the exchange on his own. Well, what he may not understand is the exchange has specific means testing that is going to occur before the guy can get a premium credit. So if the guy is well paid or is paid enough in terms of Papaka's definitions, he won't be able to get those credits and he won't be able to cause the problem for the employer. So what have we got? Well, you see the two columns. We have an employer who offers no coverage and then we have an employer who offers coverage. Obviously, an employer with no coverage could be eligible for penalties at the $2,000 rate. An employer who offers coverage could be eligible at the two or $3,000 rate. We already know that. Let's go through the different situations of the employee. In the first one, the employee is so low paid, he's under the 133% poverty level, or if he's working in the state of Texas, under the 100% poverty level. And when he goes to the exchange, he is put into Medicaid or Medi-Cal. At that point, the employer gets no premium, uh, gets no penalty. Why? Because an individual would not get premium tax assistance to buy a policy if they were going into Medi-Cal or Medicaid for free. Without that premium tax credit, there is no penalty to the employer. So in point of fact, some of the uh, smallest employers paying the lowest amount of money may never receive a, a premium tax, uh, may never see a penalty because his employees will never be eligible for one. They'll be eligible for Medi-Cal instead. Now we've got a second group, though. This is a group that's above the minimum federal poverty level uh, to some degree. It could be as high as 400% above the federal poverty level. We'll look at what that, what that constitutes in a few minutes. But the point being here is they qualify for some level of premium tax credit. And it's a sliding scale. The guy at 138 might get 99.5% of, of his policy paid for by the government. The guy at 400% might only get 50 cents worth of premium tax credit. But wherever he may fall, if the offer, if the employer offers no coverage, then that employee would be eligible for premium credits, no matter where he stands in the federal poverty level. If he was over 400, then he would not be. What if the employer offers coverage? Well, then the guy could be eligible, depending upon how the employer is offering it. We'll look at that in a moment. That has to do with affordability. Go to the next line. Regardless of where the person is against the federal poverty level, would they be eligible for premium credits if the, offer, if the employer offered no coverage? Yes, he would be eligible. What if the employer offers coverage would he be eligible, as the descriptor says, only if what the employer is asking him to pay exceeds 9.5% of the wages that employer pays? Originally, this was 9.5% of his household income. That would have been impossible for an employer to measure, so they changed the definition. As a broker, you can help your employer determine who might set off a premium tax credit by knowing how much they pay, and how much you're asking on a payroll deduction. To demonstrate the point, let's say you have a very low paid person, $1,000 per month is their wages, or $12,000. The employer is, is charging everybody a flat $100 a month for their payroll contribution to health care. At that point, that employee making $12,000 is paying $1,200 a month, or 10% of his gross wages, and that means he's exceeding the 9.5. That employee could go to the exchange and get premium credits, which could kick off penalties to the employer. Rather obviously, the answer to that one is to either reduce how much you're asking the employees to pay, or perhaps in that isolated case I just gave you, uh, we give the guy a, a small raise every month and take his contributions above or below the 9.5% level. Finally, in the last category, an employee could be eligible for premium credits and hence the employer eligible for penalties if the plan being offered did not meet the bronze level coverage, which is 60% of the average health care costs. In other words, 
it didn't meet the minimum definition of what insurance is. It had too high deductible, too high coinsurance, whatever it might be, or it was not a plan that met the essential benefits definition we talked about in our first seminar. What is a 400% poverty level? Well, it depends on the number of children you have. On the left-hand side, the number of persons in the family, then eight would be a mom and dad, could be a dad and seven kids, or a mom and seven kids, but typically mom, dad, and six kids. You can see it'd be $148,000. So anyone below 148 with that number of kids could be eligible for premium credits. But let's just say for fun that that 148 was earned by one spouse. The other spouse would stay at home with the six kids. Remember, the affordability test is going to be on the basis of 9.5%. So that would be a lot of money. And I also want to clarify that the 9.5% is only on the individual coverage, not on the total family coverage. So it would be pretty hard for that person at $148,000 to actually uh, come up with premium tax credits if they were making that much, even though they have a family of eight, because the coverage at work would be the affordability test. Well, when we look at these credits, think of it as a federal tax refund, so to speak. In other words, you do your taxes at the end of the year, you owe $6,000. A credit is where the government says, we're going to give you taxes back before we paid them to you in the amount of $3,000, so you simply pay $3,000. A credit is worth a lot more than a deduction, needless to, to say. But in this particular business, the exchange is going to estimate the amount of federal tax credits that the, employee, that the individual buying the policy might end up being eligible for. The exchange is going to notify the IRS that person X is going to come up with a $2,000 credit, perhaps, or whatever it may be. And the IRS will send to the exchange that credit in advance. That credit will then be sent to the insurance company, not to the individual. Because all that's happening here is the exchange is contracting with Mr. Blue Cross, for example to have an individual policy, a Blue Cross individual policy, sold through the exchange. Let's say for fun that policy was $5,000 a year. Mr. Blue Cross doesn't care who pays the $5,000 as long as he gets his $5,000. The exchange does the tax work with the individual, calls the federal government IRS up, says send us $2,000, they tell the individual who's buying the policy, you write us a check for $3,000, they take his check for three, the government's check for two, for the total five, and send it to Mr. Blue Cross. Everybody's happy. Now, I'm using annual numbers to demonstrate the point. Obviously, a person is not going to be paying an annual premium in the exchange, but rather a monthly premium. Secondarily, because this is an advance on a refundable tax credit, if at the end of the year, when the guy fills out his, um, his actual tax return, if it turns out that he was not eligible for that tax credit that got paid in his name, he will owe the government that money. Obviously, this means that the individual must file a tax return. That's going to cause some complications for some folks, particularly undocumented workers and other individuals who may not exactly be playing fair and square with the tax returns. The amount of credit is obviously based on a sliding scale. The lesser you make, the more credit you're going to get until you drop below a certain level and then you go to Medi-Cal. The premium credits are going to assume that the individual caught, bought a silver level of coverage. In other words, a coverage level approximating about 70% of his possible claims. So if he buys a bronze, he doesn't get cash back. It just simply costs, uh, costs him less money. If he buys up and buys a, a gold instead of the silver, any extra money he would have to pay out of his pocket. I might, know, I might note also that applies to the affordability. Remember our 9.5% test on the, on the employer? The 9.5 assumes the silver level, and if the individual chooses to buy up, then anything above that 9.5 because of the buy up is his problem, not the employer's problem. The bronze pays 60, silver 70, gold 80, platinum 90. We're going to come back to what this uh, mythical 60% of coverage, 70% of coverage, et cetera, is. Well, when we talk about these 60% of average coverage, 
you have to understand that this is an actuarial mythical number. The way I like to explain this is this. Imagine I had all the medical records of California in front of me and all the money that was paid out for medical care. And I took that total amount of all the medical care in California and divided it through our entire population. And I came up as an example with every person in California averages $10,000 in medical costs. We know that's not right because in major risk pool analysis, we know about 92% of the people don't get anywhere close to their average costs, but 8% of the people use up a lot more than the average. So I may have no cost at all, and 90 more of you may have no cost, but eight of us may have ten have a million dollars in cost, and on average it comes out to $10,000. So once the actuary has described this mythical average cost, then the bronze, silver, gold, platinum is reflects the type of plan that will on average pay 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of the actuarial definition of average cost, hypothetically. It's a $10,000 actuarial average, and I sell you a plan which is a $4,000 deductible, 100% coinsurance plan. In other words, as soon as you meet your $4,000 in deductibles, everything's paid. In that example, I, the insurance company, cover $66,000, you pay $4,000 of your deductible, and my plan has met the 60% calculated value. If I sell you a plan with a $3,000 deductible, I, the insurance company, pay seven of the claims, you pay three out of the deductible, I've met a 70%. Needless to say, that's going to be a very complicated thing to figure out because how do you calculate average uh, costs and payments comparing a $500 PPO 80-20 up to $2,500 out of pocket with uh, various different levels on a four-tier medical prescription card versus a staff model HMO with $250 per day hospitalization uh, deductible on the first three days of the visit plus a $40 office co-payment and a three-tiered uh, pharmaceutical benefit. The exchange and the federal government will be coming up with a calculator, a way to put in all the benefits of every one of the plans to come up with this mythical average number being covered. And we'll probably have enough information on that after January 1st, 2013, to do some more training with you to understand how this will really work in reality. Either way, just think of it this way. The bronze plan is going to cover 60% of the calculation, and as long as it does that with minimum essential benefits and doesn't violate the 9.5% of the guy's pay on affordability, then that is called an affordable policy, and most of those, pre of those penalties can be avoided. As we described in one of our earlier sessions, there will be a small kind of category, what we call catastrophic or high deductible policy, which may fall under 60%, but that will be for people under 30 only. And the carriers will come out to us with more information about that. So what about these premium credits? Let's assume the essential benefits uh, are not being paid or the 9.5% uh, is being avoided or the guy's just offering no coverage whatsoever. What kind of premium credits can the person get? Well, Papaka actually defines what's the maximum an exchange can charge a person as to instead of setting what the credit would be. What Papaka basically says is we're going to decide based upon the guy's income, household earnings, and all these other stuff, the most that a policy can cost him, and the credit will be whatever's missing. So in one state, a given policy could cost $6,000. The same policy in another state could be seven, and in the next state it could be four. But that particular person, just as an example, might have a calculation that says the most you can charge him is $3,000. So with a $3,000 maximum charge out of his checkbook, the government would pay the remainder of the five, six, or 7000 whatever is being charged in each of those states. So how do we go about calculating that thing? Because as you can see from the chart that just popped up, we're going to need to know the federal poverty level, family size, the maximum premium allowed, and the actual cost of the insurance plan. So let's take a look. 
At the bottom is the maximum annual premium if something is unaffordable or doesn't meet the essential benefits and the guy goes to the exchange and buys it or he doesn't have coverage at all. As you can see, the lower on the income, income scale, the lower the maximum annual premium is going to be. For our hypothetical example, we're going to assume that a person is at the 200% of the federal poverty level. The family size is four. In looking across the chart at the bottom, we find that the maximum that family can be charged is $2,778. But for whatever reason, hypothetical in this particular given state, the actual cost of the insurance is $5,000 for the year. So his credit is going to be paid is $2,222. That money will be sent to the Fed, from the federal government to the exchange. He will pay his premium out of his own pocket of $2,778. The two will be combined together, and the $5,000 will be shipped to the insurance company. What's individual penalty? Well, we talked about the fact that if uh, an individual doesn't have coverage, whether he's working or not working doesn't really make any difference. Whether coverage is offered at work or not offered at work doesn't really make a difference. If he does not pay for his own individual coverage. He could substitute any of those plans you see on the screen. Any of those will fulfill the requirement of staying insured. Or at the last one, he buys a pot product from the individual market. But if he chooses not to do that, then he's going to pay a tax penalty based upon a flat rate or a portion of his gross income. So in our hypothetical situation, we'll fill in some numbers and say he's got a $60,000 gross income. His standard deduction and personal exemptions are subtracted. That's the only subtractions in the PAPACA calculation that the IRS will be using. So there's probably going to be another separate form for a person to fill out when he files his tax returns. He will then be taxed on the remainder, which in this case is 50650 bucks times 1% the first year. It's going to go up to about 2.5% and destined to rise higher later. So it would be a $507 tax. Or he could pay the flat tax. In that case, under E, he's going to be asked, how many adults do you have in the house, basically 18 or over? In this case, it's him and his wife. The flat tax starts off at 95 bucks for the first year or 190 bucks for the two family. He has one baby under 18, and the flat tax for them the first year is going to be 4750 The 4750 and the 190 are added together for $237.50. But on his taxes, he will pay the greater of the two. In this case, he'll pay the tax of 507 bucks. Well, if you think about it, there's a couple things that lead us directly into our next, uh, our next uh, seminar. First, of course, you're going to have to decide whether a group is small or large, and you're going to have to advise an employer about that very issue. The penalties are going to depend upon whether the employee is receiving a premium credit or not receiving a premium credit, or even if, whether he goes to the exchange or not. And there's obviously going to be variations from state to state. There's still a lot of questions to be decided and regulations to come out, so we'll have to continue looking at this math at a later date. But the questions you should probably most ask yourself in preparation for the next and last of our four seminars is this. Why would an individual buy a health insurance policy and not just pay the $507 tax penalty? Why would an employer keep his employees covered and not just throw them out on the street into the exchange and simply pay the penalty? Because as most of you recognize, even if the employer pays two or $3,000 per person, that's probably less money than he would pay for the premiums in his group health insurance. But our last class is going to suggest this, that too many people are getting very excited about thinking they can save a lot of money by dumping their health insurance and dumping us agents and brokers and just letting their employees fend for themselves. In the last class, which we title How to Advise an Employer About Papaka, we are going to look at the reality and compare the mythical savings if I drop everybody and just pay penalties versus the actual costs that's going to incur to an employer in ways he hasn't even expected. It's the same kind of analysis we'll use for an individual. Because the individual, while he may be able to get a health insurance policy that covers pre-existing conditions at a later date, he may be able to delay buying his health policy and just pay the tax penalty, he's going to discover that there's a lot more at risk than that 507 bucks we used in the examples. So the next time we get together, we'll get give you some information on how to advise an employer about Papaka and it will teach you why 
you'll still be in this game after 2014.